opinions unqualified. Um, I remember being Sam. Welcome, first. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Dixie. That's yeah. great to be here. Yeah. So, uh, well, welcome to uh, episode forty-three. Yeah, that's yeah. 43. 43 of opinions on If I remember being a kid and I could never, ever do the armpit fast like that. You couldn't do it? Could not do it. I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried and I could just never work it out. Were you, were you left out as a child? Because I feel like <laughs> yeah. that was just like a really big part of childhood after all. <laughs> yeah. You don't like to be able to do that. No, no, I, was, I was very good at a lot of things, um, <laughs> but I, I couldn't do that. And some of my mates could do it that weren't as talented. Uh, add other things, so that would be their go-to. Well, you can't do this. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, a bit of uh, playground bullying there. Um, with that, so, but anyway, so, uh, Kyan was our little star there for our intro. You know, he's probably been on the pod more than anyone else, I'd say. What's up? Yeah, you're probably up. <laughs> Alright, you got to go to bed now, mate. See you, mate. <laughs> so, um, it's a Monday night, back to our normal uh, recording times, and we do have a, a guest this week. Um, didn't hear a lot of... Like uh, feedback about last week's pod, Sam, when it was just the two of us. No, you know, it, was, it was a bit quiet as well, I think. Yeah, um, it was rocking our world, but views might have gone down slightly, but that's all right, you know. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. You know, we'll uh, we'll get uh, we'll get our today's guest, who's who's highly uh, popular in his own mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but he's been on the pod before, so welcome, T Bomber. How are you, brother? Hey, brother, and or oh, Sammy as well. Other brother from another mother. Yeah, brother. Yeah, pretty much. Brothers from another mother. Is this our first um, three feet? Yes. Yeah, I think this is our first three feet. You know, he just, I don't know, he, he just plans his visits very, very well. <laughs> so I just happen to be, you know, coming around to pick up some mail today um, because he's, he's working fly in, fly out at the moment. He's got some mail getting delivered here, yeah. um, which we're going to talk about in, in a little bit. But uh, he's like, oh, I'll pick Monday night because you know what, Sam and, and, and Nixie, <laughs> they uh, record the old pod <laughs> and I might get a guest, a guest <laughs> appearance on it. So. Uh, good planning, um, Troy. Yeah, I have to say I'm a bit of an attention whore when it comes to these things. So, <laughs> but speaking about the armpit thing, though, I uh, my well, crying shame is when I was growing up, I couldn't whistle, but I'm in a house full of whistlers. Yeah, that's true. You can't. Whistle. I can't wow. whistle at all. Yeah, we whistle all the time. Oh. Yeah. That's... Yeah, I. <laughs> that's, that's, as as I, that's as good as I go, guys. Yeah, it's actually quite funny. That's... But if you do the armpit thing. Yeah. So, so you guys just had, well, you know, you had one downfall. Yeah. One sin, well, that's, that's it. Like, mm. Apart from are, that, perfection. We are follically challenged as well. Yeah. Uh, Troy's yeah. starting to get to the point where he's actually embracing that. But True. Yeah, we're a bit, a bit follically challenged. Um, so there's some big news coming out of the state today, Sammy. Yeah, it was very, um, very interesting. Um, it popped up, and um, obviously we've just just come out of our, uh, well, not just. How long? How when was our five day lockdown? Two weeks ago. Now we've had a whole week back at work where we had to wear the masks. Yeah. And now we're into relatively normal life. Yeah, back to back to pre lockdown. So it's not mm. normal life, yeah. but uh, this is a new normal, I think. Um and then uh, today apparently there's a twenty two year old female um, from that arrived from Melbourne that was supposed to be uh, quarantining here in WA and um, she's nowhere to be found. Yeah, so that's I think I think there's gotta be a sense of, um, uh, I guess, uh, responsibility from those that have come over to try and do the right thing. So the one thing with Western Australia that I've really respected, and not all of us have been happy, and I've probably been one of the ones that weren't happy that we had to go into five-day lockdown with one case, uh, but as a, as a whole, the community has really knuckled down and, and done what's needed so that we can get back to normal life as quickly as possible. And to have someone sort of, well, I'm just going to you know, leave, um, I think there's got to be severe uh, repercussions uh, when she's found, and, and hopefully, from our point of view, she's safe and healthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, I, th- I think if you are in that situation, you've been allowed into the state, which is really hard to do at the moment. Like well, we're not letting a lot of people in, uh, you should be following the rules. What do you think, Tibon? Well, I, what she's actually doing is similar to what happened in the eastern states in a way, where they did some door-to-door checks. You know, when they're doing for the major lockdowns at the start of last year, and they found that about. Almost three quarters of all the doors they knocked on, uh, knocked on, didn't have people quarantining when they should have been. Was that in Victoria or here? Yeah, Victoria. I heard um, it was quite similar here as well. That there's, oh. there's so many reported cases, but then there was even more like unreported. Yeah, well, I know when uh, one, uh, one of our greatest guests, Chad, was on. Um, he got visited multiple times oh. in the two weeks that he was locked down here. Yeah. Um, and he, the only days he was out out were day 11 to go get the, the extra testing done that you have to get mm-hmm. on the 11th day. Other than that, he was at home 
and he'd get checked on at random times. I think it might have been like six times or something that he got wow. checked on. So in two weeks. Um, so you're sort of playing with fire a little bit if you decide that you want to duck out. So. Well, that's it. I mean, especially um, especially in WA when there's so few people they'll be quarantining, they're going to be checking you a lot. Maybe in Eastern States, especially with the high of the quarantine, there was quite a lot of people there. Uh, there's a you might have risked it thinking, well, there's only so many coppers who could actually come in and see you know see where I am. But in Australia, you know, in WA, I mean, the numbers are what in quarantine like maybe single di- like double digits, like yeah, yeah maybe I, you know, I twenty or so. Actually, know the figures. I know in Victoria, I know. A couple of people that they were in quarantine that didn't get checked on at all in two weeks. Yeah. So they were just sitting at home doing the right thing. Yeah. Didn't get checked on. Not once. But in WA, you're going to be checked on, guaranteed, multiple times, I reckon. Yeah. It would be interesting to see, but because you can't really, they can't always just be going checking everywhere. True. You know, like they've still got other stuff that they need to attend to, I guess. Mm. Um, mm. So. Well, well, they do have law. The yeah. law to uphold, I guess. Can't just be door knocking. <laughs> yeah, all day. Yeah, but they are willing to sit on the side of a road and ping people for two k's over. Anyway, <laughs> we won't go into that. Um, you know, there's there's one thing. Well, there's a couple of things I like, but one of the things I like is is getting caught in the rain. I don't necessarily like pina coladas though, Sam. You don't like, but you're not a fan. Not a not a fan of pina coladas, Ooh. but I love a good cocktail. Cocktails are, and you know what I like about cocktails as well. It kind of uh, kind of goes what we were talking about last week with uh, me and you defying gender norms. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's nothing more empowering, I find, than ordering a cocktail at a bar of some sort um, and just embracing it. I, you, know, you know what? I think, I think if you're man enough to go order a cocktail at a bar and drink it, you're man enough for me. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think sometimes, you know, if you think, you know what, I've worked hard. I want something maybe a little bit sweeter, um, and this cocktail is really appealing to me. And, you know, they might have a special one. Yep. And you know, you want to get it. For instance, the Brass Monkey, fifteen dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. That's I mean, the best cocktail ever. It'd, it'd be rude not to, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be. And I think, you know, the, the one thing about cocktails that that I really, really enjoy hmm. is the making of the cocktails. They can be fun. They can be very fun to make, that's for sure. It's creative and it's, I feel like when you're making cocktails, it's like a science experiment. So you've got to get this portion of this and this portion of this. For me, it's an extra little portion of some things. <laughs> yes. All right, and then you shake it all up and then you pour it out and you get the ice and it's just it's a really wonderful feeling. I guess it would be quite satisfying. It's like a bit of um, sort of like after you do the lawns, you know, you kind of feel like you've accomplished something. So when you have a cocktail, you've gone through all that effort, it uh, tastes all the sweeter. Yeah, I, I um, obviously it's good when you're following a recipe, you know, and you can you make maybe a couple of tweaks to where they add say sixty mil, you might bump that number up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But also, I really like going for the um, making a cocktail with no recipe, mm. just thinking, yeah, I've got this, I've got that, I've got that. Mm. I'm just gonna whack it all together and see what I come out with. And see, some, sometimes you you're like, oh, probably should have just had a vodka cranberry. Yeah. And then other times you're like, you know what, I found a new new thing. Well, I think I think that's drinking mm. science. You know, it's 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 getting your hypothesis. Yeah. And trying to work out like a you know an end goal, mm-hmm. and then creating the potion or yeah. the you know experiment. Alchemy. Yeah, and then you end up um, being the test dummy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All yeah. in one. All, All in one. one. Yeah. yeah. So, so, it's a whole, it's a whole experiment. Yeah. Works out sometimes, and other times it just ends up being rocket fuel, I guess. Yeah, yeah. We had some <laughs> rocket fuel on on uh, Friday night, Sam. Yeah, Friday <laughs> night was. Um... So Nixie's bar. So I've worked out that the shed is a gym. It's a bar and it's a recording studio. Yeah, it's multifaceted. Yeah, so it's a multi multifaceted shed. So I think it's, it's sort of edging up in the the sh- shed category. <laughs> so I think your Sam shed still yeah, probably, probably in your mind a bit better, but. Um, this shed is, is very uh, versatile. Yeah, your shed is very versatile. Um, I think the only reason why your shed may be, um, why you think it's good or great mm. is, um, you know, it's, it's a lot easier for, for me to come here than it is for you to come to my shed. Yeah, and I was, I was thinking about it actually. I was going to have a, a Sam appreciation mm. um, session, uh, which was like, like a... Uh, I can't remember. It was two S's anyway. So <laughs> sensational Sam, or you know, um, 
anyway, an appreciation for Sam. So Sam comes to the shed every week. So I just want to say in the middle of our little oh. pod here, thank you for you know the sacrifices you make for, for making the pod happen. Um, but that's it, so we'll move on now. What I wanted to talk about with cocktails is you know when you cook food? Yeah. And some people are like, I prefer to cook it because of the work and I think it tastes better when, when I've made it myself. And yeah. other people are like, no, I prefer to go out and eat because someone makes it for me and it tastes better. And it's just a mental mm. thing. Do you think cocktails are the same? Like, if I make a cocktail, in my head it probably tastes better because I toiled over the recipe and, and put it together. Whereas, if I go out and buy one, I can be really judgy and be like, yeah, I could make a better one myself. See, my, my situation, I know mine tastes better because I put a heck of a lot more alcohol in. <laughs> so I'm like, no, Yours this tastes good. Value. Exactly, yeah. Whereas, you know, when I go actually go outside, we kind of buy, apart from the Brass Monkey $15 deal, which I drink every time I go there, <laughs> like without fail, uh, I kind of have a bit of a sip. I'm like, is this worth 20 bucks? Really? Oh, maybe, maybe not when I can, you know, probably make like something a bit more substantial at home. But, you know, drinking alone is not a good habit to get into, though. No. Cocktail or not. So, we went down in a little blast from mm-hmm. the past the other day. So, on Friday night, I had Sam and a couple of friends around, and we thought, you know what, uh, at this point in time, going out, you need to wear a mask. Let's just have a bit of Nixie bar time, and it was fun. So, when I was a, a young buck, so early 20s, you go out, we'd have illusion shakers. Oh, so that's wow. That's what we, we'd get. So, I made some illusions. And, you know, they taste pretty good, didn't they, Sammy? Yeah, that would be um, the green, green one. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I liked all of them to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. But I thought when you were in your early twenties, only a couple of years ago, what was you know you go out and I'm getting this. Was it like a cruiser or was it like Red Bull a and cocktail or was yeah. it Red Bull and vodka? Like what was Jager, the Jager go to a few yeah. years ago? Because for us it was you get an illusion shaker for you know five bucks or something. It was crazy. Yeah. Like, yep, yeah, I'll get a couple of them and, and I'm set. See, that's a really tough one. I feel um, vodka Red Bulls are probably like a, a go-to, um, especially like you'd have your pre-drinks and you'd go out and then you'd be like vodka Red Bulls. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel, I, yeah, it's a tough one actually to nail it down. And I think that's more me being that I like to experiment. Mm. I like to try different things. So I can't really nail down on what I think was the thing, but you know, any UDLs, um, spurn off double blacks, mm. um, all that kind of, yeah, cruisers. Yeah. But yeah, it's hard to say that one that really stands out. Yeah. Troy, we're the same vintage. Yeah. I mean, you're only a year and a half older than me. Um, older. Uh, what, you know, were you the same? Like, was it the illusion, the, the cocktail of choice because it was cheap and it was accessible and Easy or? I used to always have some pre-drinks, but I used to um I used to smash out uh, vodka and orange juice before a big night, um, or just a goon bag or something to be honest. <laughs> so I was I was I was a pretty pretty budget drunk. But the cocktail we used to have, which was a bit of a novelty, especially in Bunbury, was one called Brain Tumors. Okay. Where you'd actually um they put some oh you'd have the alcohol, but then you'd actually put a straw in it and you'd suck all the fumes up. And it would actually really kick in, like kick into your head pretty fast, especially you knew the barman who'd kind of make you like you know triple shots of each one. So he had like about six shooters in this glass, and you just suck it up as fast as you can through double straws, and then you just breathe in all the fumes, and just wait for it to hit you. <laughs> right, yeah, that sounds weird. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember doing it. Oh really? Oh okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I did it one night. I just can't remember. Because it sounds like that sort of thing that you'll forget things pretty easily. But yeah, I was a big fan of pre-drinks, so I used to like having a couple of drinks beforehand and then going out, and then it doesn't matter what I drank. Um, I just do want to say, just on, on behalf of the, the Opinions of Qualified podcast, we don't endorse binge drinking um, no. at all, and always drink responsibly. Uh, I think that's very, very important. Um, but I think as a, a social tool, um, it's it's an invo- important, uh, particularly Australian society, um, you know, it's acceptable and important, but, you know, make sure you're responsible when you do it. Mm, absolutely. Um, talking about uh, responsibility, um, your work life, Troy. <laughs> How's it going? My work-life balance is, doesn't doesn't quite exist at the moment. Yeah, it's a um, bit of um bit up and down at the moment. I've uh, as you guys might have mentioned before, I changed careers from working in public service for many many years, and then I went into a bit more hands-on role, and now my hands-on role has got me into the into the mines, but not regular work in the mines. It's more like last-minute phone calls. So uh, so I was telling my brother a bit earlier, I 
flew in late last night and then got a phone call earlier today saying, Troy, we need you to fly out tomorrow and then I'll be doing that for a week and then I'll be coming back for a day and I'll be flying out to a different location after that. So it's a bit up and down from day shift to night shift to day, but um, it's it's helping me, uh, well, it's it's keeping me busy, put it that way. What, what I probably want to talk about most in regards to mm. fly-in, fly-out work is, is how you keep a, a healthy routine. At my current role is not quite the healthy routine side of things because just as the nature of the job itself, I get a lot of last minute work where they'd say, quick, we need somebody or, you know, Troy, we've got some work for you. Can you can you go up there? Basically, that's how it is. They give me a ring. But I did work uh, for about nine months in the mines as an offsider, which was regular work, fly and fly out, two weeks on, one week off. And that routine, once you have a couple of swings, it wasn't too difficult because you'd actually know once you went to work, that was, you just, you know, woke up, worked, came back, slept, and that was your entire life for two weeks. And then for your week off, you'd, you know, let your hair down, do all those little things you've got to do. If you've got a partner, you hang out with them. If you don't have a partner, you hang out with everyone else. And, um, yeah, and try not to, you know, spend too much and blow yourself out too much during the week because you've got to do it all again the following fortnight. But it's, um, I, it's not, I wouldn't say it's that difficult once you've got a set routine going. See, um, it's when uh, the hours change, when you go from day to night shift, and then the like your swings might be extended longer. So I've been on swings before where you only been in the bed for four days, then it gets blown out to ten days, and that's when things get a little bit uh, a little bit difficult to deal with because you know even the simple things like bringing enough clothing with you, especially when you're only limited to 10, kil- uh, ten kilos for your bags, it's a bit hard to try and juggle that in the off chance that you might be sent away again. Even when I worked in the department um, when I was assessing refugees. Uh, sometimes I'd be doing work over in like you know Nauru or Manus Island and that, and I'd be about to actually up on the almost about to get on the plane. And I'm like, oh no, Troy, we need you to stay. And there you are. I'm actually there for like another week or so. So um, I guess it just helps to be flexible and keep an open mind and just realise it's work and know that it will be over eventually, and you can relax. So when you're talking about relationships, you mentioned mentioned relationships. Yeah. What sort of toll do you think fly in fly out work has on on people's relationships and have you like spoken to people that you work with or had experiences where you're like it's really hard to uh to get things happening or to keep mm. things like maintaining a, a healthy relationship that's it's funny you say that because uh I, I work a lot of blokes i work with especially the older boys around my age and older almost all of us are divorced which um says something about that my flying work flying flight work obviously didn't you know result in that but a lot of the guys they do this for a while and it does take a toll on the relationship uh, sometimes the opposite direction, though. Sometimes the boys, they stop doing fly and fly out, spend more time, fa- more time with family. But when they do spend more time with family, they've realised both them and their partner have started living different lives. And because they've been living apart for so long, uh, trying to mesh together again, it just doesn't... They don't seem to gel, which um, can be difficult. I think... Now, though, I think it's a bit easier because back when I used to be in the mines in the, uh, in the 2000s, we didn't have, didn't have smartphones... Um, there was no such thing as FaceTime. Uh, there was no reception there. It was hard to keep in contact. Basically, when I went away for two weeks, that was it. You're gone. Or actually, sometimes it was three weeks then. There's no contact for the entire time unless you manage to find some kind of landline somewhere. But now, since you can maintain contact, you can talk to your family, you can talk to your kids, you can talk to your partner, you can um, maintain that contact and that connection, which can be lost over a long period of time doing that kind of work. So I think, you know... I. I think the environment's changing. And also, the companies now really focus on those relationships because that's what's important. If you don't keep your workers happy, if relationship pop- problems start popping up, they're not going to show up to work or things are going to kind of go off the rails a bit and it's just going to be a bad time for everybody, let alone the danger you can be in and you know, actually your workmates. If you're on a work site and if, you're, if your head's not in the game, things can go wrong. Like in my role, you know, I actually hang off ropes a lot now. If you're not thinking, well, people get hurt. You know, things get dropped. People can get seriously injured. So, I heard the uh, the beers are really cheap up there as well. Um, <laughs> They're about five dollars, I think. Yeah, yeah so that's I've, a bit dangerous. I've heard, I've heard cheaper than that. Um, not not on my sites. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, which I think is really interesting because obviously, uh, um, like I've heard, there's not much to do there. It's either after you finish your work, you know, you either go to the gym. Yep. Yep. Or you go to the pub, yep, and then you go or you to do bed, both. you know, or you, or you know, or you do both if you if you can fit it in. 
Well, they got they do have messes there, but the messes limit you. Like you can only take two drinks away with you at a time a lot of the time, so you can't just stock them up in your room. And the hours, you know, the, the, the taverns aren't late, open that late. So they normally kind of shut them down about 8 o'clock. So, and they don't really appreciate it if you get smashed because they also test you on site as well. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's not like a, it's not the drinking culture it was when I, like when I first went in the mines. That was, that was a different kettle of fish entirely. That was a lot of drinking, <laughs> a lot of drinking all the time. So what I've actually heard from people that, you know, you said uh, they work a, like a day shift and into a night shift and then that, that can severely reduce your life like because of the imbalance of sleep and particularly night shift. I've heard that night shift, every year you do it, can take off a certain amount of time of your life or something. Is that factual? Is that something you've heard? It is, but night shift is more in regards to if you're doing night shift for a long period of time. So if you're just doing night shift, let's say for a year... Uh, they say that can actually, um, yeah, they can shorten your life by, yeah, by you know years, and it also does all sorts of things to your insides, I guess. But um, yeah, I've it's heard that. But no. you're not getting as much sun because the sun, the sun is healthy. Vitamin D, yeah, you need that vitamin D. I'm all about people getting D in them. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, <laughs> vitamin D, look, it's, you know, you know what I mean, Sam. <laughs> I think it's more of circadian rhythm, but yeah. Um, Troy, you are, I'm very impressed with you just in general because uh, firstly, uh, you had to grow up in my shadow, um, which, <laughs> is, which is really, really tough. I was known but, as Charles Nix's brother at school, yes. <laughs> which is funny considering you're a year older. But anyway, um, what I want to talk to you, I, I'm impressed when people perform, uh, I guess... Um, what would you call it? Uh, activities. Um, it's, that's not a strong enough word. Feats. When, when humans perform feats, that I don't think humans should naturally be able to do it. <laughs> and I feel like you've done this on a couple of occasions. So you've ran two marathons yep. uh, in your life. Um, and for me, I find that just remarkable, uh, just for the fact that, that someone can run, was it 42 days? 42 and a half, yeah. Yeah, 42 and a half kilometres you know, in one, one sitting. So I just wanted to say well, congratulations on, on complete, competing a couple a marathon. That's unbelievable. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Troy just got a phone call. Yeah. That's, right. yeah. That's right, take it. Yeah, right. take it, Troy. I will talk about the marathon. Yeah, it's back in a second. Me, it's just, me, uh, me, uh, me. Door's been called three we're, times in the span of three we're, minutes. We're opinions unqualified. And, yeah. um, and we, we take it in one take. We're, That's what we and, do. and we're very good at giving unqualified opinions on matters like marathons, where I have done, um, I've probably done negative 500 marathons. Um, I'm the same. Like, I, I couldn't imagine finishing. A marathon because, like, I run 5k's once every 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like an accumulator? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I cannot, I cannot just focus for that amount of time to stay in the zone. Yeah, just running, like, <laughs> well, I think anyone that can run for the sake of running, I don't get they got a strong mind. Yeah, I'd, I'd need, to, I'd, I'd be like a dog, I'd need someone to throw a ball for me every like 100 meters. Yeah, I understand, because if I'm chasing something, so with ball sports, basketball, football, you know, I could play all day, and I could just keep going, like we'll often have pick-up games, and we'll play five or six games in a row, and you're like, yeah, I can just keep going, and you're moving, and you're sprinting, and you're going different paces, uh, but to go one pace, and it's, those guys sprint. Yeah, they good pace. For like 40 to and a half Ks, and to be able to keep focus, it's just it's something that just blows my mind. Yeah, I am. Um, well, how's this for a story, right? I um, know of someone that their wife, um, as a present, gave them uh, like a triathlon thing, like entered them into a triathlon. Oh, wow. And that person had never done done a triathlon before. Was it a full triathlon? Uh, I can't remember, but they definitely, their wife signed them up That's to crazy. a triathlon. Does How would you feel if, you, if your wife... Um, Gifted you a, an entrance to a triathlon that you uh, have never done before. Well, there's one of two ways I'm going to feel. I'm either going to feel like she's got this ridiculous belief in me that I don't have, 
and she believes in me, or she's trying to tell me something about my current <laughs> state of, of physical, um, I guess, attractiveness, <laughs> where I need to go out and do some exercise. So there's one yeah. or two ways, depending on how I'm feeling. Um, yeah, that's an interesting gift. I think, I think if I gave that to Jacinta, she would kill me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Troy's back. Is yeah, he It's all right. Yes, and hello. He's, he's back. So first person to take a phone call on the pod. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Sorry, sorry. That's a first. We love that. It was, it was three missed calls and it was uh, for my daughter and she just wanted to ask a question about a bus ride, oh. like a bus pass. And I just went, I, I, I'll call you later, sweetie. Oh. <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought it was something, you know, That's much more important. Because it was three phone calls in a row. She just kept on calling. I'm going, oh, yeah, shit, maybe, maybe something's happened. Yeah, yeah. But now yeah, I'm like, ah, well, I says, I'll sort it out later. I'll call you <laughs> soon, okay? So I want to talk about uh, the. I guess the, the how do you get yourself ah. in, into a mental, mental frame of mind, which allows you to, to push through because that must be just, just so draining both mentally mm. and physically. Uh, obviously, training does come into it. I've um, I was the token fat kid of collie for quite a while until I got to my early twenties and I decided to lose some weight and I realised that I started enjoying running. And I've always been a bit of a runner since then. Uh, but in regards to the marathon, though, the trick is just consistent training. Like, some people are gifted and they can just go, yeah, I'll just smash one out, which, you know, maybe not a full marathon, but like a half marathon, and they seem to have no repercussions. But I, you know, kind of start off slowly doing 5K runs and over time went to 10K runs. And when I was like actually running marathons pretty regularly, um, I used to run about maybe 150, 160Ks a week. And even on the weekends, I used to um, I used to wake up at like five, run thirty k's, and then you know start making breakfast just before you know uh, my daughter would wake up from her sleep. And I'd be like, and I'd be quite chatty and you know full of beans the entire day. I was a much fitter man back. Then. This is back when I was like thirty two, so I was I was a much fitter person. Now I've got a bit of a bit of a paunch on me, so I could probably smash out ten k's now, but I can't do it in like forty minutes like I used to. Now it takes me probably about fifty five or so. So you'd run ten k's in. Oh yeah, that's so when I'm about 15 kilometers an hour or so, I guess. I guess. Yeah, and that's, that's just great for me. <laughs> but um, oh well, as I was, uh, but you know, not as fast as other guys. One time I was actually, I used to what I used to do during my lunch break when I was at work is I'd go to work, one hour lunch break, and then I would jog from uh, Harbour Town or Watertown to UWA and back, um, and then have a shower on that all within an hour. And I remember one time I did that. I, th- I thought I was pretty quick. And then Matthew Pavlich just actually went by me like I was standing still. And I just went, got a way to go, Troy. <laughs> Admittedly, he's like, you know, good like a foot and a half taller than me. But, uh, yeah, well, and a, played 15 years at AFL. Well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fitness, which is a big degree. But um, if you really want to, it's really consistency. But you do a bit of research too. Like the human body has enough calories or so to easily be able to smash out like maybe 30Ks or so. But then you hit something which they call the wall, where your body just... Do I hit that every morning? <laughs> and that's when the mental side comes in. Like the last, the last ten k's or so of a marathon, that's when it starts getting hard. The first thirty or so, it's it's not really, it's tough, but it's not too bad. And your aim for it is to try and run, do something called a negative split, where the first, the second half of the marathon, you try and run faster than the first half. So you kind of conserve yourself for the first half, and then you, you know, then you start going all out. Well. How do you I'd conserve yourself I'd in thirty k? I'd struggle with that because if I had to conserve for that, I'd be walking my first. Half. <laughs> so, so, how do you push through the wall? Uh, well, it's just a matter of grit, really. You just got to realize, well, I'm the master of my body, and you just keep on pushing through. I mean, it does come as a toll, though. Like the last marathon I ran, I did hurt myself, and I couldn't run for oh, must have been like a good four months or so. It was I ended up actually pulling a tendon inside my knee, and it was just because I just pushed a bit hard. And that's, I shouldn't have done it because what happened was that um, I, was, I was all set for the marathon but I foolishly bought a new pair of shoes a week bef- uh, actually about two weeks beforehand uh-huh. and I couldn't wear them in right and so instead of tapering a little bit like a couple of days beforehand to try and get some reserves I basically oh, went, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop running. And uh-huh. so by the time I actually got to the marathon itself I lost just that bit of conditioning which made a run which was, wouldn't have been, would have been hard but you know not tough to where I, I ended up actually hurting myself and it took me months off and as a result I yeah, haven't really run ever since well not to that degree anyway like I still do 10k runs but nothing like I used to yeah well I, I just think you know I think anyone that does a triathlon triathlons anyone, are full on yeah, anyone that does a marathon uh, 
for me, like you just must be the most mentally strong. And I think I'm quite mentally strong. Like I, with you know what I do uh, in the sporting world with my coaching, it's really important that I stay level headed and stay mm-hmm. focused and stay locked in for long periods of time and be able to, to manage a lot of things at once. But I'm not usually physically exhausted when I'm trying to do those things, um, which uh, which just for me is just because uh, I think the first thing that goes, and I find these with athletes all the time, mm. is when they get tired, their brain turns to mush, oh. completely to mush. They yeah. just make really terrible decisions. Um, you know, they, they can't stay focused and execute the simplest of skills and locked in. Um, so I think you know if you can stay locked in and, and mm. you need to, um, you know that. That, that's really impressive. Well, that's where grit comes into it, and that's where I think, especially when you guys are dealing with like uh, like athletes, the elite level, at, you know, at different stages, and if you've got someone with talent and someone with a huge amount of determination and grit, and not quite as much talent, the grit guy will get there, you know, even more so. Like he'll he'll stick with it. Like um, like I don't know, if, like Charles, you might know more about this. Like if uh, do a lot of athletes get discouraged and and as when they get discouraged. Do you find the ones which don't get discouraged as much and they're kind of willing to work through it even though they don't have the natural talent? They oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. I, I always say at the start, if I've got two, two athletes, I guess with the same, yeah. I guess, physical attributes, but one's more talented and one's more driven. Yes, driven, the, that's the, it. The driven yeah. athlete is the one that's going to be the one that makes it the furthest. Yeah. And it happens all the time. Um, it's probably more when things aren't going their way. Do you notice the mm. ones that that really knuckle down and work on the areas that they need to work on yeah. and they start to shine. Um, but they're the ones that ask for feedback and they're the yeah. ones that are, that are constantly trying to get, um, I, I guess, an edge you know, mm-hmm. on, on their competition uh, and they understand that it's hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of doing the same thing. Yeah. It's similar to a marathon, um, not doing it all at once, but you know, they're working on you know, a, a one-footed step back for an example and they're just mm-hmm. doing it thousands and thousands and thousands of times so that they can execute that shot because they know it's a shot they can get off in a game. Well, that's uh, it. When, while I was actually practicing for the marathon, I, I changed my running style, everything. Like, I actually went to the point where I was running on my toes just because I did a lot of research into it and just trying to find ways just to make it a little bit easier on my body because I don't have a runner's body. I'm pretty I'm short. I'm pretty stocky. Yeah. Um, my knees are still good, thank God, unlike the rest of the Knicks boys. Yeah. But I kind of, because when we were at school, like when I was a young tacker, they were actually taught to run with your heel strikes to the ground at times. And that's bad, yeah. real bad. So I ended up changing my um, running stance to running on my toes to make sure the cadence, what, spinning up the cadence as well, where my foot placements were. And it was just little steps here and there. Um, and it's just kind of going over it over and over and over. And just doing a bit of research, a bit of reading, and making sure that you learn each time you go on a run what bits you can improve. And just gets that little bit better. And that's what I think like, a lot of athletes don't understand. Like, you don't need to make gains immediately. You don't have to be a superstar after doing something you want. It's, it's 1% of the time. And, mm. and I think football, uh, in particular, is really good at uh, really celebrating, like, the, the small things. Mm. Um, mm. And I try and bring that into to my world where, you know, it's, it's the, the little things. If you do the little things and the simple things, the simple things really, really, really well and super consistently, mm. so you do it all the time, you become an extremely valuable player to your team, um, and you'll be you'll be um, you'll you'll be surprised at how that opens up other areas of the game uh, as well, just by being super consistent and doing a really a simple thing really well. So, um, yeah, a lesson there, I guess, Sam. Yeah, well, yeah, that's definitely marathons. It's um, it's not me, <laughs> but you can definitely respect all the people that do it and the the mental um, capacity and whatnot and physical. To, to do stuff like that, you know, which is pretty, um, not everyone, it's something that you can, uh, I guess if you do do it, that you can say that you've done that, not, I would say not that many other people would have, would do it. Yeah, know? well, there's not a lot of people that I know that have run a marathon, and true be, you know, a handful, and I'm around people, athletes, all the time, so mm. I think it's uh, super impressive. Um, you did mention you got some new shoes, um, before your marathon, and they which were... was yeah, that was foolish. I shouldn't have done that. I should have just worn like the you know crappy shoes I've been training in for the months beforehand. But when you're doing that kind of mileage every week, they wore out yeah, pretty quick. Right. But it takes time to wear into them too. But uh, yeah, no, thank you. But I'd say what you do, Sammy, is pretty impressive. I've seen you on the court. <laughs> no, I'm alright. 
Yeah, you know, right? Yeah, I'm, like, like I can't score it. I can't score, score a shot at all. And I see, like, when I see uh, Wood Chows with a football, even now, I just think it's just magic. I go, how does he? How does he grab it? How does he do it? It's all fluid and poetry in motion. Hours and hours. Yeah, and exactly. Hours and hours. Again, it's our only little internal marathon and something we love. So That's it. We, we do it. Um, so what I was getting to is, mm. is I got some new shoes today. So <laughs> what did you get? What did you get? So I got oh. some, some black and green KDs. Yeah. And I got green because that's my club colour and I love it. And they just are the most spectacular <laughs> thing in the world. I opened them. And what I just wanted to talk about, like, it, it doesn't have to be mm. shoes, but for me, shoes are one of those things. When I get a new pair of basketball shoes, I get so excited. I'm like, man, this is so good. And I've got them and I'm there and I just want to put them on and I want to wear them around the house and start wearing them in. Is there anything that you're like, like with that? Like, obviously, with the, when you've got your new skateboard, you're pretty... Yeah, skateboard. Yeah, pretty, <laughs> pretty chuffed up. about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but say like a piece of clothing or an item, you're, you're a bit of a t-shirt guy. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't really... Like shoes. Like when I go get shoes, I, I go like... Even lately when I've been getting basketball shoes, I've gone in, I've said, what's the cheapest shoe? Yeah. And then I've said, just give me like the next five you know, from that price going yeah. up and then I just try them on and then whatever the, the price and comfort matches, yep. then I'm like, all right, yeah, that's me, no worries. Well, I don't really, yeah. But then it's just, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I used to get really excited, but now it's just like they're just another pair of shoes. Oh, man, I love it. I think, did mum say the story in one of the earliest podcasts about you getting that pair of shoes from the... Uh from the sporting store? Yeah, yeah, I used oh, to that's go right, yeah, and buy them with him all the oh, time. Amazing. I used to find ways to, to get the shoes I wanted for a really cheap price. Whereas I was like a more, I used to wear like Aero Sports, where the cheapest ones were really. Aero Sports were cool though. Well, they're cool now. Back then they weren't cool. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Well, I was, my, my running shoes, uh, I think they were a $15 pair of running shoes from Audi. But you've already and just told us you don't run. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why, that's why I've been able to have them for like five years. But they actually, like, there's no, where the ball of my foot is, there's no, mm. like, rubber there anymore. Like, really? it's, yeah. So, I'm like, I really need to get, like, new shoes. And like, I want to get, like, some runners. Mm. Um, mm. And I went, I looked at, like, Kmart. Because I'm probably just going to get runners from Kmart for, like, $25. Are you going to go running? No. But oh, I want well, runners. that's fine. Okay. Yeah, see, I, I, I've used runners to lift. And I found that my shoes are wearing and breaking in really weird spots. So oh. I need to get on and, and find some shoes that are... Because if I'm doing that three times a week or four some weeks and, you know, squatting and, you know, doing a heap of stuff, I need to make sure that, you know, I've got shoes that can support you, me. You, you know you, can, you should yeah. buy? You should buy a pair of thongs. I wear thongs at the moment for my workouts. It's great. You can, um... <laughs> it's a bit dangerous. <laughs> Actually, uh, you can get something called zero drop shoes where there's there's no heel in them. And so the sole, it's basically just a sole. And well, they're quite good for good for weightlifting. The, the weightlifters, they say, like, yeah, that you have to have flat sole. That's why lots of people wear bands. Oh, really? Oh. They're flat. And bands are cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That works. Well, I might be looking at some bands then yeah. <laughs> to do some lifting. But I need to get some get some uh, shoes. But I've got new basketball shoes now. It's pretty exciting. Yes. So I just wanted to share that news with our, you know, our avid listeners. They were very pretty. And if anyone loves, you know, that sort of stuff, we're getting shoes. Hit us on the pod. Get us a new pair of shoes. Put a post picture up and hashtag us in. I got a new pair of kicks, new pair of wheels. Hashtag opinions unqualified. Bang. Start doing that. We love it. Um, <laughs> one thing that I've noticed is back in fashion. Now, Sam, you are a trendsetter. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. This is what you do. You have been wearing your beautiful. I wouldn't even call it a dirty mo. It's beautiful. No. A beautiful mo for a long period of time. And I feel it. like mo's are back. Yeah, well, they are, aren't they? Yeah, they definitely are. Um, well, for me, you know, I, I was, um, you know, as, as you as you uh, struggle uh, on top, but you don't struggle on the sides and your, your cheekbones. Yeah, no, I've got um, a, a very luscious beard. At yeah, this point. I, um, it's very full. It's got it's there's um, super supreme viscosity in my beard. Right <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> but um, I, I struggle. I struggle. Um, Forever, I've always struggled, and then um, ever since that, uh, my, my moustache has, has uh, come through. Uh, mm. It didn't come through strong, but it came through, um, and I've just always always kept it there ever since. I know, and I love it. I think it's great, but I'm seeing so many more people rocking the mode mm. now, and I feel like facial hair goes through stages. 
Like, I remember when I was in my early 20s, like, if you had a beard, mm -hmm. uh, that was gross. But then moustache has come in for a little bit, and then beards are the current rage now. But I think moustaches are back. And, Troy, you mentioned something to us earlier off the air yeah. um, about most. Well, uh, mostly uh, a lot of my workmates, a lot of the blokes about me, a lot of them in their 20s, um, in the early 30s. So, uh, and every single one has a mo. Every single guy there. In fact, I'm actually in the minority. The fact that I'm clean shaven. The only reason I'm clean shaven recently, because I normally have goatees, is because um, I just like have a bit of a change up once in a while. Are goatees dirty? Are they? I've never been a fan of a goatee. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to put it out there, Troy. Oh. You love you love a goatee, though. I think You're that's because that's because a goatee suits me. I can kind of pull one off, can't I? You should try mine. Yeah. I've been thinking about it. That was. I like, always want to actually have a handlebar mustache. No. No? Oh. No, just a mo. Just a mo? Just a mo. Just a mo. Yeah. I could give it a go. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to look very uh, very good on me because I'm I'm a bit thin. I'm actually thinner on top than you are when it comes to the moustache area. So, I don't know. I think, I think what you need to do yeah. is send us, next time you have a shave, mm -hmm. clean shave, we need a, a picture. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to give you a month challenge. And let's see what mo you can grow in a month. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, I like that. Deal. Just, just the mo, right? Yeah. Just the mo. So just the mo, just basically just the upper lip, nothing, yep, nothing yeah. fancy. No, nah. no. Nah. Well, you can do what you want with it, but, but it stops. It stops at the upper lip. Yeah. No handlebars because the handlebars is too close yeah. to the goatee. Yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just the upper lip mo. You can twirl it. You can yeah, do. You but bring it off to the side. Yeah. Deal. Okay. One month. What I'll do is I'll um. And we're gonna post it this way. As soon as you shave next. Okay. Send us a picture, and we'll post it and say the start of Troy's mo's. The T bomber Mo Challenge is happening. And then we we'll put the details. It's a month long. One month, yep. Yeah, and we're gonna see what sort of mo. I've never grow. had a mustache, so this will be interesting. Love it. But, um, yeah, this is gonna I'm excited. I'm excited to see Troy with a mustache. And I think what we'll do is we will ask one of our other listeners mm. to see if they want to be involved as well. So oh. we'll put a, a shout out and see who can grow the mo. <laughs> or one of our listeners. Love it. Yeah, love it. So we're gonna do that. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah, I think that'd be a great grow great the challenge. grow the mo. Who can grow the mo? The T bomber. So it'll be random listener versus the T bomber, and then we'll see how we go. But we need a before shot, we need an end shot, and then we'll we'll see how we go from there. Done. I'll have a I'll have a shave tonight, and we'll we'll start it off. Deal. One month. Right. So um, I'm not an avid gambler at all. Right, but every now and then I like to go down to the track uh, and put a little punt on or if there's nothing happening on TV I might put Racing Channel on and, and throw a couple bucks or something um, and it reminds me it probably reminds me of my dad more than anything else because you know when dad was around he used to love going to the trots or the races or whatever um, but you had a, a, a really good question I think this is probably another thing we can throw out to our, our people yeah, well, just whether, you know, do you go, do you choose your, your horse or your dog or whatever, you know, the race is? Do you choose it on, um, you know, their, their um, last five races or whatever? Or do you go on um, maybe uh, the jockey or something like that? Or do you go on what they're wearing? Yeah, so for me, it depends on how much time I have yeah. and how lazy I'm feeling. So if I'm, at, say, at the track and Willie Pike is riding and I want to have beers and don't really want to look at the form guy, I'm just putting money on whatever Willie's on. Yep. Yeah. Um, but generally, like if I'm there and I'm about the, the races that day, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to watch, uh, look at their form for the last five races, when their last spell was, what they run in this distance, what they're like on that track, and I'm going to have a look through. And that's why I love the horse ratings racing particularly, because you have 45 minutes between each race, and that gives you plenty of time to look at the guy. And you can go through, and it becomes a, a, a good day. Um, with dogs, it's not so cut and dry because it's, sh it's shorter between races. But generally, dogs that win win, and it's often like if they're the favourite, there's not often, and it happens obviously. But in the majority of the time, you're betting on the dog. I find that the, the favourite wins. Yeah, well, I see, I'm I'm probably opposite to you because I I usually just go someone middle of the pack. Um, and then whoever's wearing the coolest thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, and you know, I think there's some people that make money out of, of mm. gambling, like particularly in the horses and, and different things, but the majority of people, even the good punters, haven't worked it out yet. 
So I don't think there's a right or wrong way. What do you think, Tebo? I'd um, I can do both ways, but I didn't, it depends uh, how I feel at the time. Most of the time, I just see whatever name catches my eye, really. But if people ask, like, so I've had people ask me, oh, how should I choose a horse? I'm like, okay, so I get the form out and I'll show them exactly that. I'll talk to them, you know, what will actual areas mean? Because I learned from the old man also. Yeah. But I just don't put the uh, the effort involved. That, um, that you know, I normally just go for the name. Yeah, the what name jumps out to me. I don't go for the colours because my colour blindness kind of stops that. Yeah. Well, I find with names particularly, if it's the name of one of my kids, mm. ah. it goes on. Yep. Right, so if there's an indigo or anything, yeah, or, a, you know, there's not going to be a code of crime usually. Usually it's an indigo. <laughs> <laughs> Ruffies um, are good, though. I, I do actually I also choose Ruffies at times, too. Yeah, I don't mind throwing a dollar and a hundred to one, but... Yeah. Because if it comes in, you're having a good day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think we can talk about that a little bit more yeah. in depth, yeah. actually, at some point, because I think it's quite an interesting topic. We have come to the end of our time today. So, uh, T Bomber, thank you very much for being a, you know, the, the having the trifecta appearance here. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it, like I do every time. Um, thanks for uh, interrupting halfway through our podcast and taking yeah. a phone call. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but absolutely, uh, inclusive here. We think exactly. Uh, Sam, fantastic week ahead for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a great week uh, for me. Um, what about you? Yeah, no, work, you, know, yeah. you know, until this podcast makes us millions, <laughs> we're going to work tomorrow, brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. Uh, but yeah, 